Unity has launched the campaign to try and counter the extremists. Now speaking out to denounce terror and extremism. 30,000 people formed a human chain in the South this afternoon in the name of peace. We're asking if religious intolerance is on the rise. We believe that religious freedom is a fundamental human right. Giving a message that Islam is a religion of peace. We must all endeavor to spread love and a sense of community. In the name of God, the gracious, the merciful, may the peace and blessings of Almighty God be upon you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to this uh, Press Point, another live episode of Press Point. And today we are looking at persecution and discrimination um, against Ahmadi Muslims here in the UK. And that's the topic which we're examining today. Uh, by the grace of God, I'm joined with Farouk Mahmoud in the studio. Thank you, Brother Jonathan. Thank you very much indeed. Of course, today we're discussing this very important topic, whether this extremism or hate, extremism or hate's been imported in the UK through these uh, hate preachers. Uh, hopefully that's not the case, but we're seeing a few incidents happening recently where indeed one worries. Uh, in Pakistan, Ahmadis can't profess practice of preacher religion. They can't really uh, even pose as Muslims. Otherwise, they could be booked under the law for three years imprisonment. Please share with us what's your views about this. Is this part of the world safe or we should worry about these things? Send us your tweets using the hashtag PressPointMTA or send us your emails to PressPoint at mta.tv. Uh, when you send your tweets, please use the hashtag PressPointMTA because it's always easier to pick that way. And um, Brother Farouk, uh, two, two things are very nice. Uh, the first is we have a new set, um, which, is, which is rather beautiful with the screens in the background. So we're pleased with this. Uh, and also we have very, two very special guests um, on my immediate left, we have Mr. Rafiq Kayat, who is the national president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in the UK. Um, most welcome on the show, Mir Sahib. Jazakallah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum, Assalamu alaikum And also we have uh, Sir Edward Davey, uh, who's, who's on the show with us today. It's our first time to have you on the show. We're really pleased to have you with us, um, Sir Edward. Um, for, for many of the viewers at home, then they will be aware that Sir Edward's previous position was uh, as a former Secretary of State for Energy and the Environment. Um, and, and, and also Sir Edward's been a very long-term, long-time friend of not only the Ahmadiyya community, uh, but also of, 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 of those who are persecuted and discriminated against, not only in the UK, but across the world. And one of those are Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So welcome to the show. Assalamualaikum. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's good to be here. Um, and of course, it's a very important and uh, vital issue for us to tackle. So I'm glad we're able to contribute today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, 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 and uh, Farouk, uh, before, we, before we start off, um, perhaps if we frame some of these issues um, by having a look at a VT, uh, and this has some of the, the, the many issues which have been happening in the UK at the moment recently, and um, let's have a watch of that, and then we'll come back into the studio. The Ahmadiyya movement, with its motto, love for all, hatred for none, is the fastest growing sect in Islam, yet they are branded as non-Muslims. Hate speech against Ahmadis has made its way into the UK, despite religious freedom, with hate leaflets calling for killing of Ahmadi Muslims distributed around London. Persecution against Ahmadis is not a new phenomenon. Since its inception in 1889, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has faced both de jure and de facto persecution across the world. These extremist views have most strongly manifested themselves in the form of anti-Ahmadi laws in Pakistan. In 1974, political and extremist pressure led to the first ordinance forcibly declaring Ahmadis as non-Muslims. These negative attitudes have somewhat diffused to other parts of the world, including the United Kingdom. Leaflets calling for the killing of Ahmadis have been found in a South London mosque, which has connections to the Khatminabuat group. The leaflets which say those Ahmadis who refuse to convert to mainstream Islam within three days should face a capital sentence or death penalty. Although British laws against hate speech and hate crime have so far prevented serious large-scale attacks, this rising visibility of anti-Ahmadi sentiment here in the UK should be seen as a national threat and a real worry for Western governments.
Okay, <clears throat> so these are some of the, the, the issues we want to look at today. Um, so, Brother Farouk, what have you found online in terms of news stories and things? We'll start with one story only, and then we'll see some discussion on that. Uh, this story is on um, Express Tribune in Pakistan, uh, an English um, language newspaper. Normally, English newspapers are better in Pakistan in terms of truth, how they uh, tell the, the right stories. Urdu press normally is vernacular press, where they tend to be slightly more uh, biased towards the other side. Not slightly, but a lot. Uh, this story tells us, kill Ahmadis leaflets found in London Mosque. And also is given the picture of those leaflets there, Qadiani's um, uh, difference with our other Muslims, non-Muslims, and Qadiani's facts and realities. And leaflets found in the mosque said Ahmadis, uh, known as Qadiani's in this case, should be killed if they refuse to convert to mainstream Islam, and very clearly asking for murdering Ahmadi Muslims on the streets of London. So, um, Mr. Hiyat, um, what, what, what are your thoughts on this? And particularly that we're in London, we're in Morden. So for those who aren't from the UK, then Stockwell is, is maybe six or seven stops down the Northern Line from where we are today. Um, and they have a mosque and there is a mosque and there's the, the shoe rack. And then next to the shoe rack, there's a stack of leaflets, which is saying that those British citizens who live here in the UK who are Ahmadi Muslims, if they don't convert within three days, um, then it would be the right thing for essentially what we understand, the Houses of Parliament to pass a law which would permit those people to be killed. Um, what, are you, what are your comments on that? <coughs> well, <coughs> firstly, I'd like to say that I've been living in this country since the 1960s. And when I initially came here, there were very few people from the indigenous, uh, from the uh, uh, from the immigration uh, in this country. However, we've seen that grow over the years. And initially, when we were living here, there were other Muslims living here. We were living in peaceful coexistence. I had some very good friends who were, who, who were Muslims, and to this day, they continue to be my friends. But we saw that after the. Uh, the declaration in 1974, and then subsequently uh, the proclamations made by Zia al-Haq against the community, the prejudice started building up in Pakistan. And that prejudice started being exported to, to different countries around the world, and also United Kingdom. And the clerics, particularly, who have been preaching this message of hate, are now coming to this country more frequently and indeed, we are finding that they are openly preaching the message of hate in this country. And that also has led to this uh, more radicalization taking place in this, in this country, generally, within the youth. What we're seeing is that there's a particular organization called khatm e whose particular aim is to target our community, and if possible, try to eliminate the community. And they are the people who are behind most of the leafletting campaigns, both here and in Pakistan. I can jump in here, actually, yes. uh, Mr. Yad. So this is a very interesting point. So, um, and in Khartoumunabud were asked about these leaflets, and this was the response they gave. And I'd like to ask Mr. Davy about that. So this is this is what they said that um, they they said numerous different things, but they said, and Mr. Davy, you've heard uh, the essential content of it that there was that suggestion of a capital punishment for being an Ahmadi Muslim. Um, and the response that was given um, was that there, is, that there is nothing illegal in that leaflet. This is a quote. Nothing illegal in that leaflet. It's a theological position that should not be discussed in public. Not sure what that means. Uh, but at the end, it says one should not take the law into its own hands. We don't share that view in that leaflet. And then it goes on. Um, the leaflet, though we are not related to Stockwell, expresses a theological position. However, it is in bad taste. Uh, should not have been distributed in public. It's an expression of a theological position. The laws of the state must be abided by. So I suppose there's a sense there that 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 Khatam and Abu who are responding there are saying that well, well, it's not that bad because it's we're not saying that individuals should kill, uh, but they are saying it's and it's a theological debate. But they are suggesting that theologically um, that it would be right for the government to kill Ahmadis for being Ahmadis if they don't convert within three days. As a, as a former Secretary of State, what, what, what are your comments on that? I think this whole campaign of hatred and harassment and discrimination is appalling and shocking. Um, and the issue for uh, politicians of all parties and for government ministers, former and current, 
is how both the law and the police protect law-abiding citizens in this country and the Ahmadi community is one of our uh, great communities here in the United Kingdom. So the law clearly needs to be reviewed. Um, we do have some strong laws in this country against hate crimes and when I was in Parliament we passed those laws and of course one is always trying to balance the need for freedom of speech um, versus the need to protect people against uh, violence. And the law is quite clear about leaflets or speeches where there is incitement to violence. What's very interesting about what you were saying what the, about the response from that group about the leaflet is they are trying to draw a very thin line uh, by saying, well, it's a theological position, not actually a statement of what they're asking people to do. And I wonder whether, if that was put in front of a judge, whether the judge would agree with that group's position. Because it seems to me that that is incitement to violence. And that is, in my view, against the law. Now, I'm not a learned judge, uh, and I'm not legally trained, um, but anything that sounds like you are urging people to, to commit violence looks to me like you should have a uh, uh, an assumption, a presumption mm -hmm. of caution to protect people who would be otherwise hurt. And we have believe uh, with the tragedy in Glasgow that maybe there are people who are uh, at the, who are being, having violence committed against them. So while we can't necessarily prove that yet, it's very important that the police, who are obviously enforcing the law, look at this extraordinarily closely. Yes. I think well, I'd, like yes. to, I'd like to yes, just yeah. come in. <coughs> you see, it's not just the leaflets. I mean, it's a much wider and bigger problem. It is the clerics who are coming in and preaching hate in their f sermons in the mosques. It is about them appearing on television. We have a huge number of Pakistani television channels here now, so-called Islamic channels. And they openly come and propagate the hate message on this. And in fact, they call us Wajib al Qatul on, on these channels. Liable to be liable killed. To be killed. And the Ofcom have taken this matter seriously. And some of these people, uh, some of these channels have been fined heavily as a result. But that is not enough. Also, on the websites and social media, there's a huge number of uh, literature that is being portrayed against the community. And that too is. Uh, feeding into this mm. me message of hate and intolerance yeah. in this country. I, I think that um, rather nicely um, Sir Edward and, and Mr Hyatt have, have actually managed to almost hit onto the main issues of today's mm. show. Um, before we ask even more questions on these, uh, what other news have we found that, that helps to inform the discussion? I think the same point as Mr Hyatt just mentioned, I think very importantly, we, we looked at one of the interviews by Akbar Chaudhary, who's um, a spokesperson for Khatmin Abu'ath organisation and on mideasteye.net, uh, what he says is very interesting, and I'm, I'm going to ask you that question, because he's uh, said something about Ahmadis, which probably you can sort of answer better. He says, he's a spokesperson for the Khatmin Abu'ath Academy, he said that, um, and he claimed that he has spoken at more than 100 mosques around the UK, uh, which um, also uh, was set up to counter the Ahmadi PR machine, he says, uh, which was engaged in a campaign to vilify Muslims, he says, so that the niche agenda is promoted. So two questions there. Why, are he said, why is he saying that we are vilifying Muslims, are we? Secondly, what is the niche agenda Ahmadis have? I think, uh, you know, he has nothing to say better than that. The fact of the matter is that, uh, and Ed will be able to verify that, that the fundamental job that we're doing in this country is to promote peace. His, holy, his Holiness, as a Masroor Ahmed, uh, has continuously, at every possible opportunity, promoted peace in this country and also around the world. He's gone and addressed parliaments and a whole lot of people around the world. But one thing he said is that peace can only be based on justice. Without justice, there's going to be no peace in our society. So our community has been working very hard to promote peace. In fact, we don't engage with people like Hadmin Abuath. We have no, no need to. We, we want to promote the true teaching of Islam to the people of this country and around the world. Therefore, it is because we ignore them that they feel that they need to say something against us. So, so when they say that this is a niche agenda, probably it's the prevalence of justice we're asking that's for. Right, that's, that's, that's a niche right, agenda. That's yeah. right, indeed. So I, th I think um, um, 
now would be a useful time. What we wanted to do to get a sense of is um, not only from, the, from, from within the studio, but also on the streets, what do people on the British streets think about, about the things that are taking place and, and the very strong media coverage which has been given to the underlying um, potential discrimination and, and, uh, and, and the, the points which you're raising today. Um, and we have, we have a video to have a look at that now. So let's go to that and let's go and have a look on the streets, what the views of the public are. Freedom is saying whatever you feel to say, and hate speech is basically not agreeing with what someone else says. I think it's uh, sort of difficult to define each. I think everyone has their own opinion of, of this subject. So whatever I might think of hate speech, the other person might think of freedom of speech. Well, the thing is, the freedom of speech comes with the responsibility. You see, freedom of speech does not mean you should offend someone. That's my point. How can maintain, I think the balance is already being maintained. We have laws already in place in this country that determine what is hate and what is freedom of speech. And I think it's been working pretty well so far. You know, but I think we would carry on if it wasn't working. I think there'd be just violence on the streets. As maintain the balance. It's going to carry on happening, isn't it? Everyone's going to have freedom of speech and hate speech. They're both going to be there. People are going to agree and people are going to disagree. Well, I think it's something to do with the media as well. If media calm down a little bit about certain things, then people will, you know, follow code. It's, it's the media who stir up all these uh, problems, really, I think. So, Mr. Um, Sir Edward, um, looking at this, uh, um, Sir Edward's given me permission to call him Ed, but I uh, and, and I'm very grateful for that. So I will I, I, I will use that. So that's that's a sign of um, Sir Edward's humility. So so Ed, if I may, um, looking at the, what we can hear here, then um, to to put it in, in a very common sense or, or layman's terms, um, then 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 for many Muslims, they will say that. Um, that we're not saying that we want to go out ourselves and, and kill Ahmadi Muslims, but they say that our imams and our scholars, uh, based on religious edicts, have told us that it is, it is obligatory in Islam that someone who is um, either an apostate uh, or a serious blasphemer, um, that they should be killed. And, I'm, and, they, and then they will say, I'm a British person, I'm a British Muslim, but my faith requires me to think that. Um, and therefore that is my view and in that sense I do think that Ahmadis, um, if they don't convert within three days, they should be killed. Um, and, and so, so what, what are your thoughts on that? Because th there are people out there who perhaps would benefit from some guidance to some extent on, on what is the, 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 the establishment or the governmental view. And I know that uh, you, you're, you're not currently in that ministerial post. But to perhaps get some guidance from Westminster, almost, on, on uh, is that a legitimate view to hold? Of course, it's not. Um, I find sometimes these debates quite difficult. Um, I'm a Christian. I'm a pra practicing Christian, uh, but also I like to think I know a little bit about history. I've studied history, and history is littered with all faiths having ex extremists amongst them who preach hatred against other parts of the same faith. And um, as someone who brings to faith a degree of, I hope, rational reason and logic, it does seem to me odd when you look at the scriptures of all the major religions, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Sikhs or whoever, there is a fundamental tenet of nonviolence and of peace. And people who preach this type of uh, theology, I don't even think it is theology really, I just think it's uh, nonsense. Um, th they seem to be undermining their own religion. I think anyone, I think if a Muslim is, is preaching violence, I don't think actually they are Muslims, uh, from my knowledge of, limited knowledge of the Quran. So I, I think, you know, as a Christian, the idea that uh, it's in the Christian faith to go and uh, kill other people because of the things they believe, of course, is, is, against, is against the fundamental of Christianity. Yeah. That's what binds the great faiths yeah. uh, together. So, so and then moving to the political world, yeah. the, the political world, whether it's in the United Kingdom or the United States or, or frankly, across most of uh, the world now, 
there's a fundamental belief in the right of people to practice their freedom, uh, their, their religion, with freedom. Uh, so freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of thought. Uh, and people who attack that, I think, are also not just attacking their, actually, tenets of probably their own religion, but also tenets of modern society. So th that's why we need to push back against these people mm -hmm. who are harassing and discriminating and persecuting yeah. people. If, uh, and as you said, there's, there's, you said there's, a, there's, there's a balance that in, in politics and in the law that needs to be struck between freedom of belief, freedom of speech, but also hate speech and, and, and stopping the incitement of hate speech. Is there a difficult period ahead and a difficult period in time within Britain um, um, where we need to work out what are legitimate Muslim views to be held and which aren't? And I say this because there's Muslim, almost there's constituencies which are predominantly uh, with Muslim um, uh, constituents in, in Bradford and in other country, in other places. And, and if it is right, as has been suggested, that actually these aren't fringe views, but these are perhaps widely held views, um, unfortunately, and, and that is remains to be tested and to be discussed today. But if it is the case that actually mainstream clerics um, hold views which go against some of the principles you talked about there, um, yet they are constituents and there are large numbers of those constituents. Maybe there aren't, in fact. Maybe it is just the, the, a fringe well, and we can discuss that. It's not that large number, to be honest. I think what really yeah, and, and if it is just a fringe. But how then do MPs on doorsteps respond? How do national governments respond when they find that actually there are constituents out there who themselves may hold views which, which aren't completely in line with what are the traditional British values which you talked about of peace, tolerance, freedom. How do you, how do you, ta how do you tackle that? You stand up to it. Uh, it, it. I had many occasions when constituents came to me with views which I disagree with, not just on these types of issues, but on wide issues. And if I didn't agree with them, I told them I didn't agree with them. Um, and that's the job of politicians, to stand up for the values and the beliefs that they aspire to and uh, tell people they're about. I mean, uh, I, I've long known about the, this problem and uh, work with people both in my constituency and the wider Ahmadi community. Uh, and I was just, before we came on air, giving an example of something that happened almost a decade ago now, where I was in Serbson High Street, and a person who I knew from Kingston Mosque came to me and said, um, we know there's an Ahmadi standing for the Liberal Democrats at the council elections, and me and my friends aren't going to vote for you anymore. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sorry, but, um, we do not ask someone's religion when they join the Liberal Democrats. They have to agree to our party's values and principles and policies, but we have people from all religions and none. And, and that, the same goes for all political parties. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite outrageous that, that a group should, should think that, and the only way to deal with that is to stand up and say, well, we don't agree, we're not accepting your pressure and in fact, you're wrong. And that is the only way, I think. Just a question. I, th I think um, it, it makes a lot of sense now, but I think um, it's taken so many years now. As Amisa mentioned, he's been here for a number of years, and ever since 84, law was promulgated by the General Zeal at that time. Um, things have become from, you know, far worse ever since. Do you think should have been snubbed much earlier? And when you see the, the evil in the bud, must be nipped there. And also, uh, you, you've, you've, you hold very high moral values, therefore you sort of snub them. But do you think it's across the board, same idea with, by all the politicians, when they see they might lose the voters there, would they not sort of compromise slightly on their principles? Oh, I'm sure some people do, but there are, you know, I don't think there are some values that you can compromise on. Mm. Um, sometimes when you get down to the law, there are difficult judgments to make. We were talking about the leaflet, whether it did incite violence or not. Mm. It's a judgment ultimately because it's drawing a very, they're, they're treading a very thin line. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think um, the president, I heard him on the uh, BBC Radio 4 Today programme recently, and he, you were brilliant if you don't mind me saying so, and you were raising the issue about whether we need to revisit uh, the laws on hate crime. Yes. And I think that makes sense because they're relatively new, but they've been in place for seven or eight years now. Uh, and therefore, we have some experience about how they are working. And it may be that they need to be tightened up. Equally, it may be that the police need better training and become more aware of how to enforce them. Mm. 
because I'm very conscious as someone who, who was in Parliament for 18 years passing laws, that sometimes when I talk to people who were supposed to enforce them or know about them, they didn't actually know about them and didn't enforce well, them. It's, so it's, actually making sure the police yes. and security forces understand what they have been, what lawmakers have, have done and yes. then enforce it is also very important. Yes. Mr. Yatt, I yes. know you want to respond yes, and I then I have a question I, yes. for you as well. I think what, one of the most important things that we have in the West is freedom of speech. Yet with freedom of speech, we must have resp responsibility as well. And even the European law says that freedom of speech, whilst it's very important in the society, but if it creates disorder in society, then it must be stopped. Mm. We've seen what has happened in the Charlie Hebdo affair, where perhaps they've gone too far and the reaction totally condemned what happened, but you can see the re reaction that came out of that. The so the difficulty it causes level. on the community level. Now the thing is that with the Muslims, if they continue this message of intolerance and hate, and it builds up in people, eventually there will be enough uh, people who are affected by it that they will take law into their own hands and want to do something damage, as we've seen recently. And you know, it is not only here. We've seen in the in the drama rugby affair, these people how how they they're mentally disabled, and yet. If you, if you preach them that message of intolerance, then they will go and do damage in society. So the importance of strengthening the police's hand in the, in the uh, hate crime uh, legislation, I think is very, very important. I think we, what we found is previously, when we had the, the issue with the leaflets, the police tried to go to the public prosecutor and see if they could prosecute these people, and the prosecutor did not pursue that because they felt that it wasn't strong enough. Now, unless the legislation actually strengthens the police's hand, they'll find it difficult to go and prosecute some of, some of these people. Mm. And I think that is where... Uh, uh, Mr. What I wanted to, to bring in here is, are we, are we on a part of a paradigm shift? Is this a tipping point in, the, in these recent times? Because has it traditionally been viewed as purely a inter-Muslim community issue to resolve theological disputes between themselves. Some people think this, others think that, and leave it to them. Has, has, has there come a tipping point at which the nation has recognised that actually there's something much more sinister going on here? I think it's very true. I think recent events have now led to the whole uh, media, firstly, who challenged what was happening, and they put some of the so-called radical Muslims under the spotlight and said, what you're doing is not, uh, not tolerable in our society. And yet, some of those people came back and still continued to fight their corner. And now we've seen that we started a campaign, uh, United Against Extremism campaign in Scotland. And the whole community, uh, whether there was Jewish, Christians, Sikhs, Muslims, all came together and said, yes, no, we, we want to support this campaign. And that led to the questions being asked in the House of Parliament from uh, the, question, uh, the Prime Minister question time, where they said that we should support such, a, such a, a movement, and the Prime Minister endorsed that. So I think there is now change taking place, and I think everyone wants to try and go towards a peaceful society, and they feel this is very, very important that we come together as a society to fight against this extremism. Mm -hmm. To the fruit, what else have we found online? I think online? probably another angle we might take now is in fact pretty useful from what Musa have just said. Um, is in fact, the, the issue is much bigger than what it looks to be at the moment because it's not just the hate into Muslim faith hate, if you like. It's now one of the stories on independent, in fact, editorials was written recently, that um, inter Muslim faith hate is a small issue compared to the widespread intolerance of Muslims in Britain, so from the other side as well. So, of course, we don't have to, have to entirely agree with what they're saying, but I think they, they've noticed one thing that intolerance in, the, in Britain against Muslims in general is also increasing. So one sentence at the end, and I, I'll read one of the recent articles, a, a, a peer-reviewed journal uh, published an article by Oxford professor, which is very interesting to, to sort of have a look at in a couple of seconds. As terrorists and hate preachers should not be given the attention to, or space to succeed in, in dividing us. So clearly the media has to play a very reasonable role in doing so. So if I may bring in uh, one of the articles I mentioned a few moments back, uh, is in fact by um, a, a, a professor from Oxford, now she is in, in LSE, Sarah Talbot, and it was about, in fact, was, was the question was, was there a correlation between uh, religious Ill, intol intolerance as well as the um, Euroscepticism? And she says that perhaps there is. 
we're not saying that um, we agree to any side, but, but interestingly, religious hatred, in fact, leads to other manifestations too. And in her view, and again, it was also authored by, uh, co-authored by four other um, professors from the University of Amsterdam, and they researched about 1,400 uh, respondents from uh, Amsterdam and from uh, Ireland. And there was a strong correlation between people believing that the ones who are from different faith must not come to this country. Um, and she's now the, the head of uh, European studies in, in LSE as a chair. So, so clearly, I think uh, issues are far bigger than they really are. And sometimes even other areas in politics, they also enter in, which they should not. Why do political issues and debates? Issues? Yes. yes. Well, I think looking at it also from, um, and, 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 and if, I, if I, I'll come first to Mr. Yat and then to Mr. Davy, if I may, to, 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 uh, to Ed, if I may, uh, to Rafiq and then to Ed. Um, this, of course, it, it, it's actually been part of a wider conversation where the whole Muslim community, in a sense, or the representatives of the Muslim community, the Muslim Council of Britain, um, issued a response um, where they felt that it was necessary to clarify what their views was on relation to Ahmadi Muslims. And, and that's an interesting response which they've given, and I'd like to, um, to ask you some questions on it, if I may. So just to, to summarise, essentially, this was on the 6th of April. They, they said the, the MCB um, fully subscribes to pluralism and peaceful coexistence and acknowledges the rights of all to believe as they choose without co coercion, fear and intimidation. Uh, it also says we affirm the right of Ahmadis to their freedom of belief and reject any attacks on their property or persons. And then it goes on. Uh, despite our clear theological beliefs, we note that pressure is mounting to, to describe this community, Ahmadis, as Muslim. Muslims should not be forced to class Ahmadis as, Muslim, as Muslims if they do not wish to do so. At the same time, we call on Muslims to be sensitive and above all, respect all people, irrespective of belief or background. Mr. Hiat, what, what, what do you think about this? Yes, you see, the thing is that uh, just because they decided to legislate in, in Pakistan that we would declare them non-Muslims does not mean that under Islamic uh, law that we are non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. You see, under Islamic law, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, said that anyone who repeats the kalma, he's a Muslim, full stop. There was no, no qualification of that. The reason why they introduced legislation was a political reason because they were under pressure from Saudi Arabia, and Bhutto, who, who introduced the legislation, actually was a friend of the community initially. He was a secular leader. He was not a religious fanatic. Um, but under pressure from Saudi Arabia, money coming in, everything, he decided to use our community as a pawn in the bigger chessboard. Now, that has implications. At that stage, our Khalifa said that you will start with us, but this is not where it stops. It will poison the whole of the, the community. And we've seen now in Pakistan, what has happened is, yes, it started with us, but then it's Sunni, Shia dispute has started. Mm -hmm. Now other sects are fighting each other. Each mm. other are calling each other kafir, mm. which means that you know they're outside the fall of Islam. So disbelievers. The, this this top this particular um, sorry to to to, um, to come in there in, in many ways is is this a even more nuanced uh, and challenging approach, which is essentially and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Essentially, what the Muslim Council of Britain is saying is that um, we don't think you should be killed. They've said here. Uh, we don't think you should be persecuted, um, but but we shouldn't be forced to say that you're Muslim. Uh, and they've used the word. Uh, we note that pressure is mounting to describe this community as Muslim. So so is that right? That um, that 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 I well. In fact, the main point is: is it right um, that they should be able to say that, um, as they've described here? Uh, we have the right to say you are not Muslim. As an Ahmadi Muslim, how do you feel about why, that? Why do and they, as the president, how do you feel about that? Why do they even have to discuss that, right? Why is there need? Faith is something between an individual and God. And that should be left to God to decide who is right or who is wrong. Mm -hmm. It is not for another individual to decide. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in my opinion, the British Council of Muslims have no right to decide who is a Muslim or not, and therefore they should not go and reinforce that. Today okay. it will be us, tomorrow it will be somebody else. Okay. So, you know, we've had this in the Christian faith as well. There was a time when the Catholics did not accept Protestants as, as Christians. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are going into that type of theological uh, issues here. Mm -hmm. I think we, faith is something that should be between person and God, 
and we should leave it at that. Nobody has the right to decide who believes in what. Mm. And you know, for the Muslim Council of Britain to say, when we have built this mosque, this beautiful mosque, it's the house of Allah. Muslim Council of Britain and then General Secretary came on, on BBC Radio 4 when I was being interviewed and he said, these are Qadianis, these are Marseilles, they have no right to call this a mosque. Mm. This is the house of Allah, everyone can come pray here. Mm. Why, why is there a problem in calling it a mosque? Well, th this is something that, it, 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 has there been um, a, a shift in, in the Muslim Council of Britain stance? And I want to come back to that with you, if I may. But Mr. Davey, do you have any thoughts on the Muslim Council of Britain statements? Um, you may, you may not. It's, it's, they've looked to raise different points within there, but what are your thoughts? Well, I've uh, got friends who are uh, involved in the Muslim Council of Britain, um, and um, I know many of them do some very good works. Um, I detect from the statement you've read out a shift in their position. It may not be the shift that uh, or the Ahmadi community would like to see eventually, but I think the shift should be welcomed. Uh, and I think that is probably a result of the, uh, the awareness raising that the community has done. I have to say I totally agree with the, the president completely. Uh, whether you're a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, a Sikh is actually between you and your God and no one else either he, only in your heart and what God believes about you um, can be the judge of what your, your religion, your beliefs are. And the idea that um, any other person, or any other group can define that uh, relationship between you, God, is, is, is clearly a nonsense. And the president is absolutely right. I mean, in uh, this country, we have had uh, violence between Protestants and Catholics and Catholics and Protestants and nonconformists over our history. And the only way we reconciled it, uh, and we sort of still uh, even playing that out with the Church of England being the established faith and the Queen being the head of the Church of England, we, we reconciled that over time gradually and people realizing that hating each other because of, of what their faith is, when you can't really know what their faith is and actually it's up to their relationship with God, is a, is a t total waste of time and uh, frankly wrong in itself. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope that these extremists uh, gradually uh, are isolated. A fear I have, and this has nothing to do with the MCB, it's more, more broadly, mm -hmm. the sorts of people who would still say it is right to kill an Ahmadi Muslim. I wonder whether they have connections with the sort of extremist Islam that is also preaching violence right. uh, more broadly. Yeah. Um, and I think we, that is the sort of uh, group of people, um, and I call them actually criminals because that's what they are. Um, they need to be isolated. And whether it's the Ahmadi community, the Muslim Council of Britain or whoever, it is in our joint interest to isolate those people and call them criminals and see them as criminals because they help fuel something which is underlying your point, which is the Islamophobia we see uh, in the UK and the world today. Mm. And it, there is shocking Islamophobia. Yeah. And to uh, put a clear line on that. And we, we have to uh, uh, say both to non-Muslims and Muslims who are stoking that Islamophobia, uh, you know, we, you are not acceptable. Uh, and um, I think it was very interesting what the reference to the professor from Oxford, yes, from LSE, uh, from LSE yeah. linking that type of view with people who want to pull out of Europe. And you'll have to excuse me as a as a politician linking that to a existing question on the table now here in Britain about whether Britain should stay in the European Union or not. Mm -hmm. I believe the European Union, imperfect though it is, just like any government that is man-made, is imperfect. The European Union still represents a set of values against persecution, against discrimination, and for peace, and for security, for people working together. And that, that is incredibly valuable. And, it rep and most of the member states of the European Union, because they are democracies that respect human rights, they value individuals as individuals, whatever their religion. And that is actually an amazing institution that has brought 28 countries together to share those values. And it would be a historic mistake for the United Kingdom to pull out uh, from a group of people, a group of countries that share those values.
And so you connected in that way. Farouk, yeah, and I know you've been, you've found we, quite a few things online. This time is very short. I think it's trying to sort of go through these things a bit quicker than I would have liked to. Um, there is, I'm just looking at some comparisons here, perhaps, and be useful uh, at this stage. Um, I'm looking at the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN. Uh, looking at the preamble first, this one sentence says, whereas recognition for the inherent dignity and of the equal inalienable rights of all members of the human family in the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world. And article number seven says, all are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. Now put that against Pakistan's law. This is from the law, not any bigotry from a religious cleric. The law says these words. Uh, uh, in 1984, General Zia al-Haq put this law through. A uh, person of Qadiani group, which is the term they use for Ahmadis out of hate, etc., calling himself a Muslim or preaching or propagating his faith, any person of the Qadiani group or Lahori group who directly or indirectly poses himself as a Muslim or calls or refers to his faith as Islam or preaches or propagates his faith or invites others to accept this faith by words either spoken or written or by visible representations or in any manner whatsoever outrages the religious beliefs, feelings of Muslims shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years and shall also be liable to fine. What do you say about that? It's outrageous. It's against all uh, civil liberties, human rights. It's a disgraceful piece of legislation. And uh, uh, I've seen when I was an MP dealing with uh, Pakistanis who, of Ahmadi faith who'd come here escaping persecution. Those are words you've, written, you've read out, but the impact that has had on the lives of hundreds of thousands of people who've had to flee Pakistan, and indeed many millions who are still there, is a real impact. And so that outrageous law ought to be abolished in Pakistan immediately. I fear it won't, but as we try to work with the past Pakistani government, uh, I hope the United Kingdom, the European Union, the United States, all those countries who share our basic values will continue to put pressure on the, the Pakistani government to repeal those laws. And I think also what's important is in fact not just these laws, uh, clearly 40 years ago, what, 30 years in this case, ago these laws were passed in Pakistan, not passed in fact by the stroke of a pen by the president of Pakistan at that stage. Um, the issue now is that it's not only in Pakistan anymore, genesis in Pakistan, but now we see those, those things are manifesting in a different way in the UK, and now we're going in the same direction, if you, if you like, unless we nip the lever in the bud in a very strong way. Amir Saab. You see, firstly, I'd like to say that intolerance comes from a lack of political and emotional maturity. And what we see there is a lack of that maturity. You know, if we had that maturity, we would not pass such laws. The key, in my opinion, is Saudi Arabia. I think they were the ones who started this process. They were the ones who put the pressure on the Pakistani government to enact these laws in the first instance. They're the ones who are exercising intolerance in their country and other countries as well. They deny human rights. They deny the basic right to women in their country. If you look at the history of Islam, the Holy Prophet's wife, uh, Khatija was a trader, and those, you know, 1400 years ago, and she was a very successful trader. And therefore, you know, to now say a woman in Saudi Arabia cannot go and sit with somebody else and talk is completely absurd. So the key lies with Saudi Arabia. Now here, also the problem is that we in the West are supporting the Saudi government. And we are supporting them because of the oil our, what we value from them is the oil. We don't, we don't really care about their, their faith or anything at all. And until and unless, and the, uh, His Holiness has continued to say this, the only way you're going to bring peace in this world is through justice. And unless we exercise justice, and unless we stand up and Obama, when he went there, said to them, look, this is not good enough. What you're doing is completely wrong. You have to change. Unless we say that, we're not going to be able to change society. Mr. Hiad, as well, if I can ask you, because w one of the things that, that we're looking at in many ways is, is this a fringe, isolated issue? Or is this actually 
a fairly uniform view across the Muslim community in the UK. Uh, and in a sense, that question needs to be answered um, for politicians to be able to understand the issue, for Ahmadis to be able to understand, um, if only for reasons of personal safety. So if I can just read you um, a piece that was here from one of the articles, which is about, and this is from The Independent, I believe, and it's about a professor from Cambridge, Professor Tim Winter. Um, and he was approached by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Student Association to have an interfaith meeting in 2013. Um, and he replied to this, uh, quote, uh, please do not bother me with this. You know your status in the eyes of the Muslim community. He, now, he, he's a university lecturer in Cambridge. Um, he then added later, I think, believe 2016, he was asked about this. And he said that, uh, again, a quote, um, he said his reply was, quote, somewhat waspish, but I regard it as extremely unwise for them to toss their views into the bare garden of undergraduate debate, particularly in the light of certain very generally, gen generally held views within the Muslim community and the real risk that the event would attract fundamentalist participation. That's a, a university professor in Cambridge, one of the most widely respected amongst the Muslim community. When, when, when Sunni Muslims will talk about uh, people that they respect, they will often talk about Hamza Youssef in America and Sheikh Tim Winter in Cambridge. He was approached by Ahmadi Muslim communities. Uh, the community, he said, please don't bother me with this. You know your state is in the eyes of the Muslim community. How much of a problem is that? It's, a, it's quite a problem, a big problem. As I mentioned earlier that, you know, what this intolerance shows is a lack of political and emotional maturity. Just education on its own does not make you mature. And if you, an educated person continues to be intolerant, that shows that he lacks something in emotional maturity. And therefore, I think people like these, they have to think about what type of a society they want to create. Right, you know, okay, we are not Muslims, but please don't judge us by our conduct. What does faith teach you? Faith teaches you to be good human beings. That's the fundamental principle of, of faith, any faith. And if we are good practicing Muslims, if we are people who love the world, the society, if we go out and we help other people, we go and clean the streets, we go and give blood donations, we raise money for charity, which are the basic things that faith teaches you, then how can that, you know, our conduct not reflect what we believe in. And what they're trying to do is deny our belief. They're saying, no, you can't be Muslims. These, these are the codes of conduct of a Muslim, but you can't be Muslims. I mean, certainly the issue, I think, in my view, uh, is not just about not being called Muslim or non-Muslim. It doesn't really bother us, to be honest. They call us Muslim or whatever. But I think that the issue is far deeper than that. Even Pakistani law, it says, you can't uh, act like a Muslim. So the words are about you posing as Muslim. So even if, for example, I'm wearing a cap, like a Muslim's cap, even that is against the law, by the way. So the issue is that tolerance, when it, intolerance starts, it sees, sees no bounds. That is where the problem is. History teaches us, we saw what happened in, in Nazi Germany. And I think we've learned nothing from that. Mm. When intolerance starts, that eventually, and we've seen it in Serbonica recently as well. You know, when intolerance starts, then the human nature becomes completely um, animal in nature, and therefore they behave in a very bad way. And we saw the genocide that took place both in Srebrenica and in, 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 in Germany. And unless we deal with that, we'll find that it will continue. And you know, we'll continue with this uncivilized society. very perceptive. Um, I went on a trip um, with the Education Trust, uh, the Holocaust Education Trust, to Auschwitz for a day. And I, I'd been to one or two of the Nazi death camps before, but I'd never been uh, in a way where I was, it helped me understand quite how it had ever got to that position where human beings were killing other human beings just for their faith. Um, and they brought to us academics who studied not just the Nazi experience, but other experiences, experiences in Rwanda, experiences in other places in the world, because there has been genocide on, on, on far too many occasions in human history. And the academics have got it down to eight steps to genocide. Mm. And the first step starts in the playground when you're hitting somebody. It's a small step. But when you start uh, not respecting your fellow human being, and gradually it ratchets up, 
Now, you have to go some way to, to, to Nazi genocide, but identifying a group of people for uh, the sorts of abuse that we've seen in those leaflets and we're seeing to the against uh, the Mali communities is quite some way. And that's a high step. And, and that's a high step. And that is, that is why people do have to take this seriously. Yes. For yourself, Mr. Davy, because there may be Muslim, many Muslims um, that may listen to this program who aren't that many Muslims, and they say, well, I don't think they're li to be liable to be killed. Uh, however, I do have a, a different view of them, and I'll just read you a, a different view of... So this was um, Shiraz Meyer, and he was a senior fellow, or he is, I think, a senior fellow at the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation at King's College London. So he studies radicalisation and how to avoid it. Um, he suggested on Facebook that he didn't regard Ahmadis as Muslims, and that's the quote, regard Ahmadis as Muslims. He later deleted the comment and apologised. Um, that's two university professors doing two slightly distinct things, but just to, you, you've heard the quote there, and the, the earlier quote from, from Professor Winter was, please don't bother me with this, you know your state is in the eyes of the Muslim community. From a, looking at it from perhaps a governmental level, a political level, um, what's your view on that? Is that, is that okay? Well, and are those kind of conversations it, it, that can happen regularly, or is that a problem? In a world of free speech and free thinking where individuals can think what they want, and I wouldn't want the government of any government to pass a law to tell me what to think, it becomes quite difficult. Um, but I think the President's got it right. It's about maturity and self-confidence. Uh, if you're worrying all the time about what other people are thinking, you're not worrying about what you are doing and how are you living your faith. That's what seems to me the, the sort of rather obsessive part about worrying about what other people are thinking. Um, God isn't worrying about what, God wants to know what you are thinking, how you are living your life. And that is why it's about this, this individual relationship with your God. And, you know, um, as a, as a give you another analogy. As a local member of parliament, I would go occasionally to uh, groups of Christian ministers from all the different denominations. And you'd have Catholics, you'd have Church of England, you'd have Baptists, you'd have Methodists, you'd have, you know, all flavours. There's a large number of different denominations of Christianity living uh, in all parts of the, the UK. Um, and if you track back their history of their relationship, it was often violent, and if not violent, pretty aggressive. And we got over that. And we got over that, and they, people now realize that it doesn't actually matter that much. What matters is what you are doing to live and breathe your faith. So, so that's where the problem is. And so history, we've learned lessons from apparently, but again, we don't want to make the same mistakes again, do we? Otherwise, we'll have a journey backwards. That's right, but uh, th that's why it, it is important to make sure we have the laws and the enforcement we've talked about. But it also means we have to have this discussion about the root causes. And I do think the root causes, as the President said, as you were saying, go back to laws that we've seen in Pakistan. And therefore, this is a dialogue that we, yes, we can have in the United Kingdom, and we should have in the United Kingdom, and take it very serious, because we can be exemplars for other countries if we get it right. Yeah. But we also do need to track it back to other countries, and in this case, particularly Pakistan, where for purely domestic political reasons, they have sown hatred. Now, how weak and pathetic are those politicians? But you also notice a lot of times we see when these terrorists coming through, we do say Pakistan's name comes up quite on top. So even Ahmadis, so what you're saying is trying to discuss this point that it began with Ahmadis, to be honest, 40 years back in Pakistan. Now you see the, the world politics at the moment. The name of Pakistanis coming in terrorism, for example, is more than it would have, Pakistan would have liked. Um, I've got a few pictures here of the posters that go on the walls in Pakistan and given to even stickers on children's school books. For example, I can sort of, we can have a look at a couple of those anyway, uh, if I may. Can I, can I just yes. point out here, I think that these academics it shows a lack of uh, confidence on, in, on themselves. They, if they can't hear views of other people, they're worried that unless they brand us in a particular way, if people listen to us and listen to the true 
uh, us painting the true picture of Islam, that people will be more convinced with our arguments than their arguments. So it shows a lack of uh, insecurity, really, on their part. Mm, that they can't, they can't, because the true uh, academic right, is, right, is neutral. That's right, absolutely. Yes. Just, uh, just uh, uh, coming uh, to, to what you mentioned, Ed, about issues of Pakistan, and in fact, because Islam is a universal religion, or it's, it's an international religion, if you're not a Muslim, you would say it's an international religion, Christianity and all of the other religions are. And you have influences coming from, as, as uh, Mr. Yihad said, Saudi Arabia, you have them from, Afghan uh, from Pakistan. Um, in Parliament recently, I think in February time, um, there was a debate about potentially um, cutting or reducing aid to Pakistan, um, almost in a way akin to that of South Africa in the, post, in the, in the apartheid era, based, based upon the continued um, uh, maintenance of these laws and also the implementation of those laws on occasion, particularly in relation to Ahmadis and other minorities. What, what's, what's your view on that, about um, looking at Pakistan as a nation and what they do at a governmental level towards minorities, including Ahmadis? It's, it's a really tricky one for this reason. Um, I'm a humanitarian, and if there are people in desperate poverty or in desperate need, whatever the mistakes of their government, yes. I worry about those individuals. And it's a really tricky one for, for governments to make decisions when you're dealing with other governments who are um, uh, sometimes shocking. I mean, you see it time and time again when we've had to deal with you know, famine in North Korea or um, issues with Zimbabwe, with Mugabe's government. And you have to find ways to help those people. Now, often that means you find ways using non-governmental organizations and finding other routes. I mean, the Ahmadi community <laughs> with uh, Humanity First is probably one of the best examples in the world of finding ways going beneath governments to get, get help to people who really need it. And I think, um, therefore, I, I'm not, wasn't party to that debate. Um, uh, but you point to a difficult balance between there's, there's difficult balance and, and with Pakistan cutting aid to governments, but also the risk towards citizens and, and vulnerable people in poverty. And it, there are other elements to the relationship between Britain and Pakistan, which make this whole, this whole thing very difficult. Because Pakistan uh, is a country that is riven, where there are many tensions, there are many very good people in Pakistan of all different yes. uh, Muslim beliefs. Yes. And, and of non-religious beliefs, um, who want the best for Pakistan and the people in Pakistan Absolutely. and all their neighbors. And to find a way to reach out to those, to empower those, mm. is important. Yeah. And it's not an easy question. I mean, I, I was learning the, just the other day about one of the, the problems that it, you have to bring the British Empire for. So this is the uh, challenge. So, you know, uh, yeah. his history yes. can bite you. And it so just very well just with Hazor's words, if, if I may, sort yes. of at the Peace well, Symposium in 2016, exactly what you've said, on very on similar lines. Uh, Hazur said, Hazur Mizam Surah Ahmed, the head of the end community, uh, and you've met him I, many a few times. times. Yeah. Uh, Hazur says um, that media to use its influence as a force for good and a force for peace by publicizing the positive activities of the majority of Muslims, he said, across the world, as opposed to the tiny minority uh, who were perpetrating mass cruelties falsely in the name of Islam. His Holiness also stated that there was no punishment for apostasy in Islam and that the Holy Quran was a standard bearer for universal religious freedom. Mr. Yad, um, we've looked at it from that governmental level. Um, what advice would you give to those Ahmadi Muslims who go to work and um, they have friends and when they're at work they build friendships and then their friends find out that actually they are uh, the wrong kind of Muslim, um, or they're at school and they're young schoolboys and or schoolgirls, and they and then their friends find out they're the wrong kind of Muslim, and they begin to lose friends. And uh, these things, at a personal level, what sort of guidance would you give them? Well, I think there's very little one can do except try to win people's hearts. I think you know if you can win people's hearts, if you can demonstrate that you're good, decent human beings, then no matter how much somebody dislikes you, what you believe in, there will be an element where there will be one by your conduct, by you, the way you, you know, the way you act. And I think that is the only way to win people's hearts. I think theology and all trying to bring all these other things in, there will all be arguments. But where I fear is sometimes, you know, when people do not know the truth. Unfortunately, some of the Muslims in this country do not know the truth about Ahmadiyya either. And they just believe whatever the cleric says. 
and that is where the danger lies. I mentioned earlier that there's uh, uh, my daughter's school. Uh, she had uh, a seven-year-old girl who was best friends with a, an Ahmadi girl who was best friends with a Muslim girl. And one day the Muslim girl came and said, my mother said that I can't be friends with you because you're an Ahmadi. That is where it is wrong. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is appalling, that's terrible. And that is where parents have to exercise better discretion mm -hmm. when do something like that because they're instilling hate in a little child who is innocent, who does not know anything, and that is where the danger lies. Exactly Thank you very much. Nazi playground right. sort of so sorry. Now. So now, um, so much has been talked about, so much could be talked about, and, and unfortunately we'll have to bring to a close now. I think just before we do as well, an important point to note then is, is, is building on what Mr. Hiada said. Um, in fact, it's often the persecution of religions that often leads in many ways to um, to, to, to much wider acceptance of those religions. Persecution of Christians by the Roman Empire led to Emperor Constantine accepting Christianity and then that, um, that, that religion flourishing. And if you look at the early history of Islam, then you have, you have uh, the prophets, companions like Bilal, who had hot stones placed upon him. And all he would say was Ahud, 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 which means one, one God, one God. So if, the, if for, those, for those such as Mr. Hyatt's, um, the, the school children are referred to, then perhaps they can take solace that, that there is in fact a, a great beauty uh, in remaining steadfast to your beliefs, even irrespective of prejudice which you face on a personal level. So thank you very much to, to all the viewers at home. Thank you most of all to, to, to Sir Edward and to uh, Mr. Hyatt for joining us today on the programme. Um, and please do join us next time. Please also comment on social media. Let us know what you think about some of the issues we've talked about today. Until next time, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you. Unity has launched the campaign to try and counter the extremists. Now speaking out to denounce terror and extremism. 30,000 people formed a human chain in the South this afternoon in the name of peace. We're asking if religious intolerance is on the rise. We believe that religious freedom is a fundamental human right. Giving a message that Islam is a religion of peace. We must all endeavor to spread love and a sense of community.